Daedalus, a clever inventor and craftsman held prisoner by King Minos of Crete, was made to design the labyrinth where the Minotaur was kept and live in captivity along with his son Icarus. He designs and builds wings for himself and Icarus to escape from the island made of feathers glued together with wax. He instructs Icarus not to fly too close to the sun or the wax will melt, but Icarus, overexcited by the freedom of flight, disobeys, so his wings fall apart and he falls into the sea and drowns. In ancient narrative versions of the Icarus myth, of which there are few and none of any great length, we don't get much sense of Icarus as an individual at all. Ovid's famous version in the Metamorphoses, the most extensive to survive, has plenty of pathos about his father's loss and Icarus's own childish disobedience leading to his fall, as well as childish playfulness in the lead up to this, in his inventor father's workshop where the fateful wings are built. But as a character, due to this lack of source material, he is otherwise a relatively blank slate for any modern analogues to superimpose upon. His childish play stands in counterpoint to Daedalus's serious work in creating the wings with which they are to escape. Several modern receptions of the myth transfer Daedalus's intelligence instead to a young Icarus figure in the text, and in some ways this is true of my focus today. Icarus's young death means that he is, of course, exclusively known as a child, unlike most famous ancient mythical figures, and this makes him in some ways an obvious protagonist for children's or young adult treatments of Greek myth, which otherwise frequently tend to adapt to mythical figures to re-emphasize their youth at the time of their famous exploits or situate them earlier in their lives than is the case in the sources. But his lack of depth as a character, along with the tragic end to his brief story, seems on the whole to have discouraged a great number of creative receptions and retellings, in contrast to many other figures from uh, Hercules to Perseus or Percy. Ovid's version makes Icarus quite a young child, and while many novel length receptions in children's literature adapt him into an older, often teen or tween protagonist, Oyeyemi's protagonist is perhaps of about the same age as Ovid's, but she is a much more serious bookish child, seeming far older than her eight years. My Focus is a young adult novel that is a reception of the Icarus story in part, Helen Oyeyemi's Icarus Girl, whose precocious eight-year-old protagonist wrestles with her biracial and bicultural identity, half British, half Nigerian, which makes her an outsider who struggles for belonging in both home and school life. The first novel by the equally precocious Nigerian British author, who was 18 at the time, it is best described as a crossover novel, but its protagonist being a child and its sharing in some Bildungsroman generic features common in children's literature are aspects that might make it appeal to young adult readers among others. It contains some very common children's literature tropes. Its protagonist, Jess, is an outsider, doesn't really have any friends her own age or in her class, and doesn't feel like she belongs among their peers, leading to the creation of an imaginary friend, at least on one reading. Jess is also characterized as precocious, and this is partly an explanation of her outsider status. But on one reading, she is also suffering with mental health problems, genuinely believing this imaginary friend to be real. As with many young adult literature protagonists, this outsider character acts in ways that reacts to that status by seeking attention. Jess fits the model of a struggling child protagonist who acts out because of her difficulties fitting in. The Icarus girl lacks any deep association between its protagonist, its Icarus figure, and any classical portrayal of Icarus as a character. But it contains substantial meta-literary elements in its engagement with the Icarus myth, along with other myths and narratives, and the incorporation of different mythical and narrative traditions, Western including Greek myth, and Yoruba as part of Jess's identity formation. I'll give a very quick synopsis of the novel. Jess is a precocious introvert who loves books. Her parents take her to Nigeria to visit the extended family. She sees strange shadows in an abandoned building. Later, she meets a girl her age, Titiola, whom she nicknames Tilly or Tilly Tilly. They sneak into Jess's grandfather's study and an amusement park where Tilly magically unlocks the gates and makes the rides work. Back in England, Jess starts school, 
Jess is moved up a year, but has trouble fitting in, throwing tantrums. Tilly appears, saying her family had just moved there from Nigeria. She helps Jess sneak into the house of a classmate who is mean to Jess. They can somehow move around her house without being seen as if invisible. Jess continues to struggle socially at school, so is taken to psychologist Dr. Mackenzie. She meets and befriends his daughter, Siobhan. Tilly often visits Jess at night. She reveals Jess had a twin, Fern, who died as a baby. Jess asks her mother about this. She admits that it's true. Her mother is upset and can't understand how Jess knew. Jess overhears her mum tell her dad that she, they should have made an Ibeji carving for Fern, a statue made for young children, for children who die young. Jess's mother says that twins live in three worlds, this one, the spirit world and the bush. Tilly's actions become more mischievous. She promises to get anyone hurting Jess. At school, Jess gets in trouble for cutting pictures from books. Jess's class gets a substitute teacher. It's unclear whether the regular teacher will return and Jess believes Tilly harmed her. Tilly appears in the bathroom mirror, begs Jess to switch places with her and shatters the glass. Jess screams at her parents and her father slaps her. Next day, he collapses and is hospitalized. Jess believes it's Tilly's doing. Tilly gets jealous of Siobhan. Jess tells Siobhan about Tilly and Siobhan tells her father, the psychologist, having promised she wouldn't. Siobhan, sleeping over at Jess's, falls down the stairs and injures herself. Jess blames Tilly. It's unclear whether Jess pushed Siobhan or Tilly caused it. Back in Nigeria for Jess's ninth birthday, grandfather gives her an Ibeji statue for Fern. Jess is disturbed by this and asks why he hadn't told her about Fern. At the birthday party, Jess spots Tilly. Tilly grabs Jess's ankle, both fall down, and Jess feels as if she's floating away. When Jess gets up, she seems different and is suddenly able to speak Yoruba. Her grandfather wants her to see a witch doctor. This causes conflict with her father. Her mum decides to take Jess to a friend in Lagos, but they get in a car crash. Jess ends up in hospital, unconscious. There's a final dreamlike scene in the bush. Jess comes face to face with Fern. Jess forces her way back into her own body, which had been taken over by Tilly. It's unclear if Tilly was ever real or a figment of Jess's imagination. The Icarus Girl is elusive and sparing in its use of the Greek myth. The disturbed protagonist of Oyeyemi's first novel, like the author herself, identifies as half Nigerian and half British, and the majority of the book's mythical references are from Yoruba stories. Though there are many overt references throughout the book to English language and European literary works and their fairy tale predecessors alike. The struggle for Jess's identity, particularly the discovery of her Nigerian heritage since she's lived all her life in Britain, is played out in and between the narrative traditions, literary and mythological and fairy tale, from her Yoruba mother's and British father's cultural inheritances. The most important Nigerian tradition throughout the plot is the Ibeji figure. This means that Jess has a different status from most children inhabiting different worlds through her dead sister's habitation of another realm. The friend she meets in Nigeria, Jess, be uh, Jess believes for about half the novel to be a real girl, but she gradually discovers that she isn't real in the same sense that she is, asking her whether she's a ghost, while the psychologist refers to her as an alter ego that Jess has constructed for herself. The ultimately scary and destructive rather than friendly Tilly, wants to swap with Jess and be alive in our world, and succeeds in doing so temporarily, which leaves Jess in an alternative kind of existence where she is invisible to most people, while still able to see them and move among them. The Nigerian traditions in the novel have been the most explored aspects in scholarship so far, along with its exploration of diaspora, Brit Black British and dual heritage identities, and its contribution to the post-colonial Nigerian literary tradition. Here I want to add in some more about the allusions and reception of classical myth to the constitution of the novel and its exploration of Jess's bicultural identity. Little hints towards the story of Icarus are threaded through the novel. The title, of course, establishes the protagonist as in some way modelled on Icarus. 
And this is reaffirmed primarily through multiple references to Jess wishing to fly and episodes where she flies either literally or figuratively or something in between in the kind of otherworldly or spirit world experiences she only has when she is with Tilly. I won't read out all the examples in the slides there. Significantly, her first trip to Nigeria is a flight into heat with hints of the sun and death. And that's the, the large quote towards the middle there. Likewise, the connection with Icarus is reaffirmed by multiple episodes where she experiences or seems to experience falling, again, often when consulting with Tilly. These aren't all the examples, but give an overview of the frequent but covert allusions to the Icarus myth and the correspondence between Jess and Icarus. There is often an inversion to the correspondence with paradoxical references to falling upwards and such like. The novel ends in an ambiguous way, which leads some scholars to say that she has destroyed herself as Icarus did, while others argue for a more open-ended or positive reading. Jess is in a car crash that puts her in a coma. At the end of the novel, in a spirit world, Jess reverses what Tilly had done to her, entering her body to become her or merge with her. At this moment, she is no longer afraid of Tilly and therefore makes her afraid in turn for the first time. She is going to get her, as Tilly had got various people close to her throughout the novel. And Jess charged towards Tilly, who was the sun, as Icarus rushed towards the destructive sun, but in this case, on the attack. It is described implicitly as a victory for Jess and not for Tilly. The description of Jess entering Tilly's flesh reverses the occasion when they had swapped bodies or worlds previously, using precisely the same words as when Tilly took over Jess's body that time. Then the last words of the story are, she jumped back into herself Jessamy Harrison woke up and up and up. This is precisely the opposite of the ending of Icarus's story. She wakes up from death-like coma and up and up. He falls down and down and down to his death. The Icarus model is thus certainly on some levels subverted. Critics interpretations of the novel's ambiguous ending range from an Icarus-like fall and thus death for Jess caused by the spirit that is Tilly, who takes over her body permanently, uh, via deliberate ambiguity to a more positive ending. If interpreted according to Nigerian tradition, as her Nigerian grandfather, and to some extent her mother, understand the situation, the ending seems unhappy for Jess. Her body, waiting, waking from a coma at the end of the narrative, might actually be inhabited by Tilly, the spirit who has replaced her, leaving Jess as a stranded spirit at best. If interpreted by Western myth-supported psychoanalysis, as her psychologist and her father would understand the situation, and her mother seemingly would like to, the inversion of the Icarus myth might be played up instead of downplayed. Jess takes a positive action to get Tilly instead of being her victim for the first time. She rushes at the sun, Tilly, and we're explicitly told that Jessamy Harrison woke up which we might take to mean that it really is her, fully, body and mind reunited, waking from the coma she's been in. Icarus, the boy, falls down and down to his death at the end of his narrative, but Jess converts her titular model and ends her narrative going up and up. The reception of the Greek myth takes the form of an equivalence between the protagonists, Icarus and Jess, which is hinted at throughout apparently to mark the difference in trajectory, the fact that Jess can overturn her apparent destiny if her fate had followed that of her mythical model. This takes place because of Oyoyemi's hybridization of the Icarus myth with Yoruba traditions, rather than a more straightforward adaptation of the Greek myth. But I would argue also that it emerges from the Icarus girl's ability to reshape stories and take more agency for herself, rather than being beholden to a preordained narrative destiny from either her European or Nigerian heritage. In fact, her dual identity proves to be the strength that enables her to reshape as well as combine stories and models and thus her own fate. Note that some of the novel's key locations for Icarus illusions, such as that aeroplane passage we saw previously, 
are equally key points of allusion to the Nigerian tradition. The fact that there's not that much Icarus allusion throughout the novel means that we can look at their significant location when they do occur. This example is setting up the Icarus correspondence for the whole novel very early on, and at the same time is putting the two identities of Jess, Western and Yoruba, and their respective explanations and worldviews for the novel, novel's events in tension. Uma's diagnosis of a conflict of interpretive regimes here is clearly right. And the text gives us no way to decide between them, so it remains ambiguous. The Sasa quote, which I won't read, is a more expansive take on the same idea. Depending on which lens you're looking at it through, the ending takes on a more positive or a more negative air. With no closure or resolution, it is impossible to decide between a psychological reading and a Nigerian mythical reading. Greek myth stands for the larger Western tradition, psychology and psychoanalysis rooted in Greek myths, and the Western narratives that Jess discusses and precociously reworks as a child reader. One of the conflicting interpretive regimes is a Western-centric worldview, which would privilege itself as being more rational uh, even while using myths from Greece and fairy tales, etc., as its basis, and would dismiss the Nigerian myths as superstition, as do most of the main characters, apart from the grandfather and Jess herself. While the Nigerian regime is incompatible with this, and at some point seems to fit what we're told better. Jess's identity is half bound up with that rational psychological tradition founded on Greek myth and Western narratives, while the other half is Nigerian. The reader has to hold the, the two in equipoise or go against the grain of the ending's determined lack of resolution if they want to favour one worldview, one of these inter alternative regimes of interpretation because of their own biases. Any reading that privileges one of the two parts of her identity and the two myth traditions that underlined her story is bound to fail, I would argue, as it's all about the mixing. At the authorial level, exploring a protagonist's bicultural identity similar to her own seems to be precisely about holding the two in tension and the impossibility of only choosing one. Just as a narrative is bookended between an English language poem and a translation of a Yoruba poem, and as Jess is inescapably torn between two cultural and narrative traditions, she might be seen at the end as fusing the two and thus transcending any enforced destiny that follows one or other traditions and story pattern. And this is reinforced by the meta-literary hints that Jess herself, far from being simply a passive reader and inheritor of narrative traditions, is a creator and a, man a creative manipulator of narratives. We are told early on that Jess altered her copy of Little Women. Parts of the text had been replaced by penciled editions, some one sentence long, some as long as a paragraph, Jess made a habit of amending books that hurt her in some way. Among other points in the novel where we learn that Jess creates and alters narratives herself, this statement seems especially significant. If the story will hurt her, she will simply amend it so that it doesn't. So perhaps it's not just the author who has two different mythical and narrative traditions to negotiate within her identity and her storytelling, who has the agency to make choices about what to incorporate from each and how to combine it. Jess herself is both a similar person to the author and a writer figure who can do the same. So I would argue that any reading that follows a predetermined pattern by one of the myths alluded to as a model for how the story should end is equally doomed to fail. The story is all about meta-literary unpickings and rewritings of stories, including those performed by Jess herself. So Jess is not bound by what happened either to Icarus or to the victim of the Ibeji spirit, Tilly. In breaking them apart and mixing them together, she can rewrite these myths however she wants. Thank you very much.